um, and um, good evening again. I've just started the recording, but Isaiah chapter 43, sorry if I said 42, my apologies, Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 8 onwards. And shall we just again ask the Lord's help with his word this evening? Lord, we thank you for the word of God that you've provided to us and how sweet it is indeed to our taste. And Lord, we pray that we may not be forgetful hearers, but you would cause us, Lord, to hear that which you say to us, to receive the word of God and pray for your gracious help, Lord, um, as I speak, that you yourself would open the word of life and grant that spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you we ask this evening. Amen. Well, I read from Isaiah 43 and from verse 8. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can de declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witness that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? Well, I was brought here by actually the last phrase of verse 9, this calling to all the nations, let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled, and, and then to skip on, let them bring forth their witnesses, that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, it is truth. And I want to speak tonight on the God of truth. Uh, and in fact, the truth, because there is only one truth when it comes to the matters of religion and of the Lord God. There is one way, isn't there, to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're in such a time, aren't we, where truth is utterly cast down in the streets. In fact, there are so many voices at the moment, aren't there? I've heard one who was uh, writing and he describes how you have at the moment misinformation, disinformation. And then he wrote about echo chambers and then about information bubbles. And, and all it can lead people to is think, well, there is no such thing as truth or truth is just what I feel like and what my fellow people who feel the same as me feel like. And, and the truth is that there's also a hunger for information at the moment, isn't there? I remember the Ecclesiastes and one, how he describes how the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ill ear filled with hearing. In other words, the human eye and ear is always wandering, seeking something new. And the truth is that it will never be filled by learning something new and mysterious. And, and at the moment, it can lead some to think, well, there is therefore no truth. It's all about what I feel and what I wish for. And this is really what is talked about here in verse six, and sorry, in verse nine, where he says, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. And who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is truth. And the book of Isaiah uses this term, this approach on several occasions and nowhere more wonderfully than in the first chapter, he says, and come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. But that call to people to come and reason with God. And it's a similar statement that he's saying here. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let there be that unity of nations. Let all the people come together and let them reason with me. Let them set forth their argument to say that they have truth. And then they will be proven. But of course, it's something of a statement, isn't it? It's rather like when the Lord Jesus Christ was presented by that woman caught in adultery. And and they say to him to try and catch him out, saying that Moses commands that she should be stoned. 
what do you say? And he simply ignores them. And then when they press him after a pause, when he writes in the ground, and you need to look back to the law of Moses to, I, I suggest, to understand what he's doing there. But he says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And then, as you recall, from the eldest to the youngest, they all left as their own hearts convicted them. When they realised they had nothing, they could not possibly cast a stone at her, because if they were doing so, they would also be judging judgment on their own selves for their sin. And they all left, or no one was left, but the Lord Jesus Christ and the woman. And it's not that God supposes here in verse 9, or knows that there is going to be truth brought forth, but he's saying this to cause everyone to realise that they do not have the answer, that there is no truth that proceeds from man. And I'm not saying in what I'm saying tonight that when I cast aside reason and study and education, those things which, my, in my opinion, when someone is set at liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ and they have that soundness of mind, the Bible should be our first and, and our whole food. But there's suddenly there's a freedom that also comes to our mind to, in the right order, look into these things. And we shouldn't be ignorant, should we, or, or foolish about these things, or unreasonable as the world might be, as a sinful man is in ourselves, as we once were. But when it comes to things of truth of God, it, it is impossible for that to come from anywhere else. Rather, there's a world now full of deception and, and lies in a staggering sense right now isn't there and then there's one who will question what another says and will push it out on social media and very soon it can be us being tossed to and fro we might well say in our hearts well there is no truth there is no way of knowing that which is right and maybe that's not a bad place for us to get to where we find that the things of the world simply will not answer that longing in our soul to know God in in the world in itself there is not an answer but in God there is. And he says this in verse 10. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servants whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And before, beside me there is no saviour. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And he's calling Israel, as it were, to be his witnesses, to witness to what God did, how he spoke to Israel, called them out from Egypt. He overturned Pharaoh and his chariots. He led them for 40 years through the wilderness and gave them his land, the mighty works that God performed in their midst. Israel were able to declare. And he, he says this in verse 12, I have declared and have saved and I have showed that when, when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And, and if we stand in two minds, whether the, the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ are true, the Lord is very gracious in that he reasons with us and he presents the, the works that he performed through Israel and now, gosh, we can say the greater works since then that we have seen in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his church that evidence is the truth of this. But he also adds one other point of evidence, that is that he has declared and he has showed. And there's no God like unto the God of the Bible who proclaims things before they come to pass and then writes them in his book that we may be able to see that God declared and showed before those things came to being. And I apologies that we're jumping into the book of Isaiah and you may, some may not be familiar with it, but just back over a page in Isaiah 41 and verse 21 to 22, he, he again continues or has preceded the passage where we are with the reasoning and he says this, produce your course, this is 41, chapter 41, verse 21, Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, 
what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. He's saying, all these gods that you believe in, well, bring the evidence. Let them bring what they have said, their prophecies, and let's examine them to see whether they came true. Let's look at what they've prophesied to the future, and, and let, us, let us see, and let's consider them, and know the end of Lazarus things, and declare us things for to come. Tell us what's going to happen in the future. Do you remember when Moses was going to Pharaoh and was saying to him, performing the miracles, let my people go. And there were those false prophets, if I could call them that. There were those magicians who were demonic in their power. And they were able to mimic some of the works of Moses, but up to a point. And then when Moses started to do certain things, which God gave him to do at that point, they had to say, this is the hand, the finger of God that is performance, because it was something that they simply couldn't do. And they had to acknowledge that this was God himself who was doing it. And I read a very interesting, if you can Google it, it's worth looking at a sermon by J.C. Ryle that was written in, around the time of the cholera outbreaks. And he said exactly that about our nation. He said, is this not the finger of God that is upon us? Who else could do this? And that's what the Lord is saying here to the false gods. Bring forth your reasoning. Let us see your evidence. Show me things that you have declared that then come to pass. Or tell me, what have you said about the future that we may see? The Bible is unique in that respect, isn't it? That it is full from the start to the finish with the declarations of a God who is outside time, who knows all things, who forms all things, whose will is irresistible. And then he says in chapter 42, verse 8 to 9, so just over the next page in, in most Bibles, chapter 42 and verse 8 and 9, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. And you see, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to believe the scriptures isn't just something that is unreasonable. That is, that is illogical, that doesn't follow examination and testing. Far from it, the Lord himself says that I am the Lord. There is none other. And let me distinguish it by this. I tell you new things before they come to pass, before they spring forth, I tell you of them. It's thrilling, isn't it, how the, the Bible does that. And, and the chief revelation of the Bible that is an example of this is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, his, both his comings. That first coming where he would be made an offering for the sin of the world and would shed his blood was foretold from the very beginning of the Bible, all the way through the Old Testament precisely foretold and you can see that can't you because when Herod the king wants to is troubled not in a good sense by hearing about the birth of Christ he calls the Jewish scribes and Pharisees and says where will Christ be born because he knows that they have their Old Testament and they said well it in Bethlehem of Judah because it's written in the prophets and they quote the Bible to say where Christ is going to be born and countless other prophecies and I, I'm not exaggerating saying that so many more than I could count in the Old Testament, which say exactly where Christ will be born, when, how and what he will do. And then the New Testament describes his life and then provides further prophecy concerning the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these things have been utterly fulfilled and that which is to come will also be fulfilled. This is the Lord, isn't it? I am the Lord, that is my name. And at a time when we might be blotted around, battered to and fro, thinking, well, there is no truth. All I hear out there is divergence of opinion. And, and I, I, therefore, there is no such thing as God. And I discount and discard all of that. What does the Lord say? No, those are the false gods. But I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. We can trust him, can't we? with all of our hearts. He is a God who has spoken, who has proved himself to be true. And, and maybe we might wonder whether we can trust him wholly.
because that's what he calls us to do, isn't it? It's to love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And we might add in soul as well from another scripture. And we might think, well, can we trust him? Doesn't it come back to this? Can I do that? Can I trust him fully? Doesn't he answer and say, I am the Lord. That is my name. And back in chapter 43 and verse 12, our passage, this is what he's referring to when he says, I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, said the Lord, that I am God. The Lord has given us evidence, hasn't he? Witnesses who are recorded here in the scripture, whereby we might know the certainty of the things which we have believed. And he says in verse 13, yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? It's a thrilling description, isn't it? How the Lord says, before the day was, I am he. Before the even time began, I am he. I, I am that I am. I am the one who had no beginning and no end. I'm the one who formed the day. That is the system whereby there's night and there's day, there's time and there are dates and months and seasons. That was all formed by the wisdom and glory of God. He, he existed unchanged before then. So he absolutely knows what is going on over the whole circle of the earth he uh, and all the inhabitants there is nothing before him not in their valley but in their greatness but it's the lord who has declared therefore to declare these things is is nothing to god is it and we might say this one one objection we might have is that uh, and maybe one further proof that he is indeed the lord is this see it's all very well to make predictions and to say what will happen before it comes to birth. But to bring it to pass demonstrates finally the absolute might of God. Consider all the things that can take place which could prevent a prophecy given thousands of years ago from coming true. But the Lord, when he declares, he also has the power to cause it to happen. This is the word of God that is utterly unbreakable. None can deliver out of my hand. I will work and who shall let it? That is, who will stop it or prevent it? And this is the might and the power of God, the, the truth that there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's why the Lord Jesus Christ was absolute in what he said. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It's exactly that same idea. There is no truth outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking here of scientific truth or knowledge of the world, but I'm talking about truth concerning the way to God and the knowledge of God. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the truth. Nothing he ever says falls to the ground un unfulfilled or ever tr proves to be wrong or inaccurate in, every, in any way. But everything that he says is utterly true and can be lent upon. Before the day was, I am he. Well, can I say just a few things just by way of concluding? Isn't it therefore so important that we hear what the Lord Jesus Christ says? There is no God other than him. There is no truth of the way to God other than in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the book of Acts, in chapter four, the Lord says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's Acts four and verse 12. There is salvation in none other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. See, it's a very simple answer, isn't it? You know, how can I be saved? It's very simple, isn't it? But it's very singular and, you, uh, and exclusive. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not on faith or another. No, it can only be in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we might say, well, that sounds unreasonable to be so narrow. But, well, let's reason together 
as the as the Bible does and say, well, let the nations gather and present, let the idols present their evidence. But look at the evidence that God has provided, the miraculous works he's provided, the statements that he's provided that none other and his ability to perform them. It is indeed the only way to the Lord, the only way to be saved from our sin is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, doesn't this also give us an urgency? Because as the Lord is the one who I am the Lord and beside me, there is no other. He was the one before the day. I am he. He is also the one who is appointed that there will be a day in which we will all give an account to the Lord. He's appointed a day in which there will be time no more. And when we will be gathered before that same Lord, not to reason with him of another truth, but to give account of ourselves for the works that we have done in the body. There's not one who gets away with anything before God, but we will all appear before him. And later in Acts, he says, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Who is that man? The Lord Jesus Christ, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and it had raised him from the dead. And isn't that another uh, another final uh, addish, addition to our, the passage this evening? He has given assurance to all men. You see, not that he has left us just to have, as it were, blind faith, but he has provided all of the evidence. He has given utter assurance of the truth of this through that demonstrable act in history, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's appointed a day at which... Every knee will bow and which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I might say this, the Lord is he, isn't he? He is singular, there is none other. And isn't it also therefore thrilling how good it is to trust in him? And this will lead us in just a moment to our final hymn. And if you've got to rush away, I'd counsel you to stay for this treasure that we have to finish off with. But... He is the everlasting God, isn't he? The creator of the ends of the earth. He, he fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon their Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Why is that? Because he is the Lord, and beside him there is no other. We may trust him wholly, might, might and we must be absolutely, we may be absolutely sure of the truth that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is a God who declares, who brings forth, whom can't be resisted? He is indeed the Lord, isn't he? He wishes us to reason, to see his witnesses, and to believe on him with all our hearts. Amen. Well, if we may sing that chorus together to finish off with, which is taken from Isaiah chapter 40. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Some of you may not know the tune, but it's very easy to, uh, very easy to follow. <laughs>
Well, we'll just close in prayer in, in one moment. But if I might mention um, and remind you of our verse for this month, which is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. And I'll just try to flash it on the screen now. But I'll read it and then I'll put it up. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Let's take that as a way to pray for one another and for the work of God. There's that precious promise, isn't there, in the word of God of how we're to pray. And we can be sure, therefore, that if we pray in that manner, that God will answer um, according to what he has said. Well, brethren, shall we commit our way to the Lord now? And then I'll leave the call open. And please feel free to stay on if you'd like to have fellowship, as I always say. As I always say. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for your graciousness, that though there is that clamour of voices bringing opposing thoughts and different thoughts to the word of God, yet you have a God who has spoken and that one whom we may trust wholly, who we may wait upon. And we pray that we may not be buffeted about by every wind of doctrine, but the world we might have our hearts fixed. Wait upon you and point others to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all that you've said. And we pray that we might wholly believe it and receive the word of God. And we commit, Lord, this week, and one another, Lord, to your hands with thanksgiving. Amen.